Good evening. I want to welcome everyone to the Southern Region RAC tonight, uh, August 2nd, 6 p.m. What's that? <laughs> We're, we're talking to the internet world. There's not a whole lot of people in the room. <laughs> uh, to start off tonight, let's, uh, if we can get an approval of the minutes and approval of the agenda and minutes, and then we'll do introductions and get the updates. But anyone want to approve the agenda and the minutes? All right, we have a Chuck. I wasn't there, but I'll second it. And Tammy has seconded it. This is always a very difficult process. We have to really figure out if we want to approve them or not. All right, all in favor, raise your hands. Any opposed? Passes unanimous. Uh, let's start off tonight with just introducing the members of the RAC. Uh, we also want to start off tonight acknowledging Wade Heaton is online representing the Wildlife Board, and then Jay Shirley is here. Uh, Jay, you want to say anything tonight? Any participation? Right now? It, sure. <laughs> Sure, I I appreciate the chance to be down here. Anytime I can get out of the Salt Lake office and be able to drive south, it's a great thing for me. So uh, just love coming to our RAC meetings and I'm trying to get around the state as often as I can to attend those. And just, I don't wanna miss the chance to tell everyone on our RAC, thank you for the time that you put in. And we've had a lot of, a lot of big issues that have come before the RAC in the last year. And it takes a lot of people a lot of time and we know everyone is busy and we appreciate the time that you put into to helping serve our constituents and stakeholders. And anyway, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate you being here and the effort to be here. It's a long way. So thank you. Before I give it over to you guys to introduce yourselves, uh, just an announcement. Nick Jorgensen has let both Kevin and I know that he's going to be resigning. He has some personal issues going on, so he will no longer be a member of the RAC. That's effective immediately. So uh, our, our thoughts and prayers are with Nick, and, and uh, hopefully everything works out to the best for him. And we've appreciated his service, really appreciate what he did. I don't know how many years, six years, seven. seven? Okay. So yeah, I think he's he's in his second term, and 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 Chad, I've, in my conversation with Nick, um, I'd really like to have him come up the next time we have our meeting in um, Cedar City, and we will present him with just a, a little gift and thank him. And I may need to lean on you to to see if you can get him here um, for that next meeting. It'll be I think it'll be the November October. A rack meeting will be the next time we're here in Cedar. If if you could help us with that, it'd be appreciated. Definitely will. Thanks, Chad. Let's go ahead and go around and introduce the rack members. Let's start. Chad, would you mind starting, and then Dan, and then we'll start over here with Verlin. Yeah, Chad Utley from St. George. I'm a member at public at large. Dan Fletcher, Bureau of Land Management, Cedar City, Utah. Berlin King, Bicknell, Utah, Agriculture. Craig Love from Burl, Agriculture. Tammy Pearson from Minersville and Beaver County elected official. You want to take it down that way, Austin, and we'll work back. Let these guys settle in here real quick. Uh, Austin Atkinson from Cedar City, representing public at large. Riley Roberts, Tropic Utah Sportsman. Chuck Chamberlain, represent the Forest Service out of Cedar City. Bart Batista, Kanab, Utah, non-consumptive. And I'm Braden Richmond, representing Sportsman uh, from Beaver, Utah. So with that, uh, we'll turn it over to you, Kevin, for the, oh, actually, I guess I need to do the Wildlife Board meeting update before I do that, and then we'll turn it over to you. So at the last Wildlife Board meeting, that was uh, back on June 2nd, uh, I'll just run through the motions made and and uh, what happened in that meeting. So there was a motion that we allow only one either sex tag for the fall hunts and we remove the public land from the fall hunts and set quotas not to exceed 1,500 for northern, 600 for central, 350 for southern and southeastern as is. That was for turkey, that was for turkey thank you. Um, yeah, I guess so this is agenda item number three, the upland game management plan. 
that motion was made by Bryce Thurgood and failed for lack of a second. There was another motion made to move that we allow either only one either sex tag for the fall hunts, remove public land from the fall hunts and set the maximum cap at 25% less than the amount sold last year for each region. That motion was made by Carl Hurst and passed unanimously. Um, under that same agenda item, there was a motion that uh, they recommend to legislator that they approve the list of hunts as presented and that we recommend the legislator put legislature put forth a relatively significant state tax before this list can be implemented and they could be hunted and that we want to incentivize through this tax the industry to go to Pittman Roberts but that if this tax is not implemented there can be no hunting with air guns so that's all related to the air gun issue that was discussed a lot in the last round that motion was made by Wade Heaton and passed unanimously. Under the same agenda item, a uh, motion to approve the remaining recommendations as presented. That was made by Carl and passed unanimously. Um, there was another motion made after that. So that's interesting. It says approve the remaining, but then there's another motion made after that. I'll just read it as it's written. So there's another motion that was made after the remainder was presented that says approve the Parker Mountain sage grass hunt as presented, and that passed unanimously. And and actually that was an additional um, agenda item that was specific to um, just to the Parker Mountain. It wasn't part of the, of yeah, the game plan. We don't plan. have that on the agenda item on the minutes. No, I think it. I think that one just went to the board, if I remember right, because of the timing. Yeah. To get the data in on our on our let counts and okay. and so. That makes sense. I'm um, on the agenda item number four, the landowner rule amendments. Uh, there was a motion to move that we remove the section of rule requiring the loss of preference points from the rule, so that this would mean that uh, the general on the general units that those tags could be sold. And that motion was made by Randy Durth and passed unanimous. Do you have a comment on that? I was just gonna say, so that's real, that's for our general season landowner permits. And that was an issue that was that was brought up by yeah. Craig and, and, and the board um, agreed. Yeah, Craig and I talked about that afterwards. So um, there was a lot of discussion on this next one and maybe ongoing discussion. So the next motion on that was to approve the landowner permit rule amendments as revised and presented to the wildlife board today and allow the division, the landowner association committee and the landowner associations to bring back any recommenda recommended changes to the August, September rack and board meetings. If no changes are brought forward, then the rule will stand as presented. And that motion was made by Carl Hurst and passed five to one with one abstention. Just a quick comment on that. That's gonna be an important one to take note of. Uh, so the way that is written is that if there's uh, additional discussions brought forward, there's a place on the agenda for it. So it can be discussed and rules made, uh, but should nothing come forth, it's gonna pass as presented. So that really puts the onus on those landowner associations. Is that as of today, the agenda today? No, that'll be the next meeting. Okay. So I, I can give you a, a little more of an update on that. So there is, the, the landowner associations are meeting. They do have some proposals. It's undetermined yet. Um, I think there will be some of the things that they brought forward that will go to the board meeting. But I think in addition to that, there will probably be ongoing dialogue between the, the division and the, and the landowner associations. So we will have a rule in place, but there may be, um, we, we have time, everybody's CORs are good for another year. And so there's time if, the, if, there can, if we can come to agreement on additional things. I don't know if we will. Um, I, I think it'll be a, an uphill battle to add anything to it, but there is, there, there'll probably be a process to look into that. So will it come through the or just to the board? No, I think if there's, so the, the, the few things, um, if there's any changes in, in, the, in the September one, that'll just go to the board because it'll be direct related to the RAC process that we just had. If there's additional stuff after that, then it will go back through the system as I think, Jay, is the, that? The motion that as accurate? written says the RAC and board meetings. Um, well, I, I don't think because, well, We'll just, I, I don't know for sure yet. We'll find out, I guess. It could go either way. If if we, if we it's if there's nothing that hasn't, that didn't get fully discussed through the rack or then they may bring it back. If it's items that were 
that were already pretty well um, talked about during the last RAC cycle, they'll probably just take it straight to the board. I guess what I would suggest with that is with additional input, and this is for everybody, this will be discussed again um, in the September rounds. And if you have additional input or thoughts, uh, it's not closed. Uh, that's what I really wanted to point out. This issue can and, and will be visited again with options to look at it. So if there's additional thoughts or discussion, now's the time. All right, and finally, uh, on there was another motion made that we asked the division to look into a youth-only dedicated hunter-type program for youth aged 12 to 17 that would allow yearly participation with harvest restrictions and this to be placed on the action log uh, that was made by Bryce Thurgood and passed unanimously. Any questions or additional discussion on the wildlife board meeting? Okay. Turn it over to you, Kevin, for the regional update. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll point out that we always have the best pictures on our regional update because Adam's a, a, a really accomplished photographer and shares his, his work with us, at least on this opening slide. Um, can we go to the next slide, Paul? So with our wildlife section, next slide. Um, really the big thing going on right now is preseason or, or preseason elk and pronghorn classification. And we'll be um, out doing a little bit more of that tomorrow morning. The biologists are usually meet together and go out and do that as a group so they can get a bunch of elk at a time. And, and that's been going on throughout the region. Um, we will be doing collecting CWD in the region this year on the Penguin, Zion, Pine Valley, and Ponsagant units. Um, there'll be different ways for those to be collected. Um, but for any information, you just call the office and, and we'll, we'll get, get you lined out to the easiest place to submit a CWD sample. Um, we also have some bear collaring efforts going on. Um, we've got chucker cameras in the field. Chucker populations and gambles quail populations are both low because of the, the several years of drought. And it'll take a few years for them to build back, but, but they will come back when, when we have good conditions. Um, this is the time here we're always doing um, prairie dog work around the region. Um, we've been conducting our, our rabbit routes. And then I would like to recognize um, Keith Day, who was really all things non-game in the southern region for the past 20 plus years, um, just retired last Friday. Um, he will leave a, he, well, he has left a huge hole in our region. There's so much institutional knowledge in that walked out of, walked out of the agency and I'm not, I'm, I'm anxious on how we're going to feel that because he was a, a program unto himself and, but we wish, wish Keith the best in, in his retirement. Next slide, please. Our aquatic section has been doing some fun stuff. Um, so one of the funner things that's been going on, and I'll show you a video here in just in a second. So Johnson Reservoir just down below Fish Lake is being drained because they're doing some work on, on the dam. So it's gonna be completely drained. It's got probably the most significant population of tiger muskies of any place in the state. And so our aquatics crew in the Southern region has been really trying to harvest uh, as many of those big fish as they can and we're moving them up to Navajo um, Lake. And, and so let me show you a video here, Paul, if we can run that of that process.
Thank you, Paul. Those last the last several minutes there when the fish were swimming right towards the camera, that was um, as they were being released up in, into Navajo. Um, we included tiger muskies and we just rewrote the, the management plan for Navajo. And, and there was a bunch of about 10 inch um, tiger muskies that went in earlier this year, but to have a chance to put um, mature fish in there, uh, we couldn't pass that up. And so that, that'll be an ongoing effort. We hope to get, I don't know, um, if we could get a hundred of them up there, that would be would be awesome. And I think anglers will will really appreciate that. Other things going on in our aquatic section, we have some emergency regulation changes because of the water conditions. Uh, Minersville Reservoir, we've increased the daily limit to four trout and we've removed the size restrictions and the, the um, bait restrictions on in Minersville. Otter Creek Reservoir, we've re re increased the daily limit to eight trout and six wipers. And those will be in effect until September 30th. Next slide. With our Washington County Field Office, um, continuing to, to work with the, the Virgin River fish and, and monitoring recruitment with those endangered fish species. Also monitoring non-native off-channel areas. That's what, what these two biologists are doing here. They're trying to see if there's any red shiners that are moving upstream um, in the gorge after a, a large rain event. Um, the complexity of water in Washington County is amazing. Um, there's actually a pump back system between Quail, Quail Creek and, and Sand Hollow Reservoirs and they move water back and forth between those two reservoirs and, and that's partially because of the, our needs to manage the, the fish in the, in the Virgin River. We've also been monitoring the Fremont River with Capitol Reef National Park, doing least, least chub population monitoring out at Clear Lake and in other places in the West Desert. And then as you can imagine, urban wildlife in Washington County is a, is a big deal. If we go to the next slide, this just shows the effort and the number of calls that they respond to um, with a staff of, you know, half a dozen people down there, over 700 calls just this year. And, and it's snakes in people's backyards, it's turtles in people's backyards, it's foxes, it's coyotes, it's cougars, it's everything. And, and we're essentially on call, you know, 16 hours a day, seven days a week for that, and they do a really good job. Next slide. Um, habitat, let me talk about both of these pictures a little bit before we move on and or maybe maybe I'll have Gary since he's right here, but that picture on the left, that's um, at our elbow ranch where we've we've put in a pivot and then reseeded there and and that used to just be a big weed patch and you can see the the seed that we put in is responding. There's still you know some some undesirable plants there, but I think over time um, that'll continue to, to come back into some really good forage. The, the, the effort there is to try to provide a place for deer and elk coming off the Monroe um, to, to, to kind of shortstop them before they end up in the fields down around Marysville. This picture on the right, um, I'm gonna take just a minute and talk about that. So this is a brand new um, pond that they put in just above Fillmore on some of our property um, because of the, the fire that's been going on there above, above Fillmore. And Chuck, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this at the expense of the Forest Service a little bit, so so just fair warned. <laughs> um, Millard County uh, called us on a Thursday afternoon, um, wanting to put in. You know, they they're worried about debris flows and floods coming down. There's a the only road that that goes up, uh, one of the main access roads to the mountain. It comes to a really narrow spot and and is is really endangered if we have a big a big um, water event come down and so they're trying to prevent that they called kind of frustrated they said we talked to the forest service about getting some settlement ponds up on the forest and they told us it would take at least a year to get through the permitting process um, we started talking on thursday we went up and met with the millard county folks on a friday and by monday afternoon this was done they were they were that quick on on getting stuff done. This is they put two two large large kind of debris basins and settlement ponds on our property. We were happy to 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 allow that to happen and 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 hopefully um, they stay dry and don't ever get used. But if if we do, yeah, I don't know if we have the wrong you know if we have the wrong rain event hit the wrong spot on that burn scar, these will become very important and and we'll we hope. Um, you know, save some flooding in, in, in Fillmore and in Millard County. So I appreciate Gary did a lot of work in a short amount of time to make that happen. And 
um, the folks in Hillard County are grateful as well. Can I, can I say something real fast? Please. I, I just want to say we were at an event, a state legislative tour in um, Nephi, Levan, technically, during the fire. And the next day, those storms were coming in. And so the Miller County commissioners were meeting. Like, we almost stopped the whole everything that we were doing to talk about this and talk about with uh, the lieutenant governor and everybody else, the legislators that were there. So thanks for stepping up because that's huge. It, it really is huge. And we all know, you know, no offense to the Forest Service, BLM or anybody else, but, you know, they're restricted by NEPA and all of that other crap and DNR can get things done. So appreciate you guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we were able to, to provide that. And, and like I said, I hope it never gets becomes something that they that they need. But if they do, they're really going to need it. So we know what how much damage those those rainstorms can do in in a in a big hurry. So yeah, it, it may not be that, but they they built that substantial. The top part of that of that dam, I pasted it off when I went and looked at it. It's sixty feet wide. There's a lot of material there that's going to have to move, and they've designed it so that there's an overflow structure on the backside, and then just modified a a um, cattle guard there to allow water to go down through the through the main stream. So, anyway, kudos to Gary and his crew for for just making that happen. So, next slide, please. Um, before we move, yeah, go ahead. This land is it DNR owned? Yeah, it was Division of Wildlife property. Okay, so so, was, so the lands guess, that we're going to talk about in our first uh, agenda item, it was one of our wildlife management areas. Okay, well, that's what I was wondering because. You know, the sit the land, a lot of times we can do a lot of things on it without having to go through all the rigmarole of the BLM for us. So I just want to know what, you know, if, if that's DNR owned land, which I always have a problem with, or is it, was it sit land? Okay. <laughs> no, it was, it was division and wild, of wildlife specific land, not even just, not just DNR land, because there's, you know, forestry, fire and state lands and others within DNR that own property. This was a wildlife management area that's fee title owned by the division of wildlife. And to talk about another one of those. So right down in, in Verlin's neck of the woods, we talked about the Bicknell Bottoms management plan. One of the main tenants of that plan was to get some, um, channels cut in the in the cattails to to allow flow of the water through that through the property more efficiently these are amazing these are called marsh masters they're kind of like a hybrid like a if a if a boat and a tank had a baby um, it would make a marsh master because they're they're completely aquatic but then they can go anywhere they'll float they'll and we so we we sprayed herbicide to cut channels in and then we in a, in a day, about 18 miles of, of work done in, in about five or six hours. They're amazing on how efficient they are. And um, I'm anxious to see it. Verlin, it should be. They said it'd take about a month for that the effects of that herbicide to start showing up. So sometime in the next few weeks here, we should be able, we should start seeing um, if we did what we, if we accomplished what we wanted to on that. So um, we'll have the Habitat Council here in the region August 11th and working on on trying to enforce our our travel management on on Braffitt's Creek is a has been an issue for a long time and we're hoping to get a permanent solution there um, irrigation season is is here and we're things seem to go really well I showed you the picture out at, at Elbow Ranch and then um, as soon as as soon as fires are happen and are kind of wrapped up, we immediately go into a, a process with the federal um, land a, um, management agencies. Um, our job in a lot of those cases is to enhance the the rehab work that they're already doing by adding additional seed or or adding it to additional areas to to make it um, to make their dollars go farther when we're when we're when we're doing fire um, rehabilitation. Next slide. Our outreach program, um, we had a mountain, mountain goat viewing event up on the Tushers just last weekend. Um, the people responded really well. We had a large group up there. The goats were a little less cooperative. I think Adam said there were two goats that showed themselves during the day. Um, with those events, you just kind of never know. 
We'll have our, our junior ranger program September 9th at Tonaquint. Um, we have interns from SUU that have been working with us through the summer that will be wrapping up their work and we're working on highlighting um, some more upcoming projects. Um, like that we, we did a good a video of the of the work at Bicknell Bottoms and then uh, Boulder Mountain Fish Sampling and the Cutthroat Spawn will be, um, Adam will, I assume will be putting together videos similar to the one we just watched on the tiger muskie transplant. Next slide. With our law enforcement, they're always busy. Um, let me just go to the picture there. We had uh, two of our officers that, that found three individuals with 98, a 98 fish over limit um, at Gunlock Reservoir. And that's what's, what's laid out on the, on the tailgate there. It, they, they look like they're all crappie, to, all crappie to me. Maybe there's a few other things mixed in there, but um, unfortunate that things like that happen, but they do. Um, our officers provide a lot of, spend a lot of time doing security work during the fire season when we have um, fire events going on and we're trying to, to control access. And then Josh Carver, our officer here in, in Cedar City, um, helped the Iron County Sheriff's Office arrest a suspect using his dog, his, his dog Cora, who's young and just new on the job and, and doing really well. I think that's it, Paul, but let's double check. So that's, that's all I have. Is there any questions for me? No questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's jump into the first agenda item. So the first agenda item, or the first action item tonight is the land use agreements rule. Uh, before we jump into that, I guess maybe let me just briefly go uh, review the process tonight. We review it every time. I'll try to do it my best from memory, but We'll take questions from the public, then questions from the RAC, and then comments. I'm sorry, questions from the RAC, questions from the public, comments from the public, and then we'll discuss it and make a motion as RAC. Um, and just always a reminder, we want to keep things civil. We want to uh, keep our comments uh, as civil and, and understand that we're here working together, understand that we're on the same team. We want the same outcomes, so um, always just professional and, and uh, mindful of that. So with that said, uh, do you want to give us a brief review and then we'll jump into questions from the public? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. My name is Chelsea Duke, and I am the Wildlife Lands Coordinator out of the Salt Lake office. I'm here today to discuss with you and ask answer questions about uh, the proposed changes to R657-28, which is the administrative use of division lands rule. That's it, huh? That's it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> questions from the rack. Well, I feel like watching after watching the other two racks, we're going to let you off real easy, maybe. All right. Go ahead, Verlin. <laughs> On these livestock grazing permits, how many of those do you have throughout the state? I mean, just guess or whatever. I, I only know, I don't know many in the state, but. We have nine in the state. Out of how, of how many properties and then how many grazing permits? With nine permits. Uh, Four of the Fillmore, one on the Barrowman Front, one in the Barrowman Valley, uh, Kingston Canyon. That doesn't add up tonight, but it's Sorry. Uh, and double red. Do you need a mic? I do, yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks. Any other questions? All right. <laughs> You're going to have to use the mic next time, Gary. Questions from the public? All, both of you. All right. Okay, let me let me review the, the yeah. comments from online. And it's going to be just as fast as that was. Um, we had no written comments. We had five people that went online and, and commented of the five, 40% strongly agreed, 
Um, Forty percent neither agreed or dis or disagreed, and twenty percent somewhat disagreed with the with what's being proposed. But there, like I said, there were no written comments on this one on the next agenda items. There were there was, and I'll summarize those when we get to it. And I don't have any comment cards from the public either. Do either of you have a comment on this one? Okay, comments from the rack. Vernon says Austin needs to say something. <laughs> um, I think my only comment was I liked the groupings. That makes sense. Makes it cleaner as far as reading and understanding. Um, somebody needs to do that with my life. Thank you. Uh, last year we tried to get the BWR to uh, open up the Bicknell Bottoms for grazing. And so we had sent an application to some of the local grazers. And it was for 12 months, or for one month, for just a little tiny piece of that, which the time I read through the 17 pages of what you can and can't do and what they'll cancel the permit if they eat the wrong kind of grass or whatever. It wasn't worth it to mess with. And uh, the word is that nobody put in for it. The word in Wayne County is that the pace has put in for it and never did get a response. So just anyway, I I think that livestock grazing is spends a lot of time. I don't, I don't know anybody that would sign up for it unless they were in desperate need. Any additional comments? I'll make one comment uh, that I think I'd just like to add on this. I do like the that we're revisiting this and uh, I think it's really important as we look at this and it gets reviewed that we keep in mind that the primary number one thing that I want to see these for, and they are for, is the wildlife. That's number one. And I really appreciate that that's identified and that is the goal. Uh, I would hope that we always keep that in the forefront on these properties. That is what they're for. So I appreciate that. Thank you. With that said, and no additional comments, I'd entertain a motion. I'll make the motion to approve as proposed. I second. So we have a first or a motion by Tammy and a second by Bart to approve as proposed. Uh, let's just do a raise of hands. All in favor? Any opposed? Dan and or Chad and Dan. Can't see you, Dan. Are you in favor? He he raised his hand virtually. He, oh, he did. He's yeah. got it. Gotcha. So passed unanimously. Okay, on to the next uh, agenda item, number six, the uh, proposed fee schedule. So if you want to give us a brief, uh, if there's anything you want to add to help us clarify or understand. And yes, we'll thank you. And we'll go to questions from the rack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Kenny Johnson, the admin services chief based in Salt Lake City. And I do think uh, one of the, one of the, um, things I wish I would have added to my original presentation, I think is worth pointing out to this group tonight. And that is um, in 20, I think it was uh, legislative session 19, so fiscal year 20, a couple years ago, we went through the, the legislative session and did a, an increase to non-residents that was pretty significant. So we, we bumped uh, deer and elk and fishing and hunting and combo. And I thought that was a little more commonly held and, and understood and known out there. And it, I kind of found out through this process that it really wasn't. And so when you looked at the fees and saw non-residents maybe didn't get quit, didn't get hit quite as, as much in some categories as others, that was, that was the impetus. So we, we feel like, uh, um, the, the proposal we have in front of you is, is fair across the board for everybody. And, and the way we took it is we kind of went top to bottom uh, with with all of the fees at about a 10% starting point. And then we looked kind of fee by fee and category by category and tried to right size some that um, 
maybe needed to to align you know somehow different i think you'll see the example of of the big birds aligning a little closer to to turkey and and some of those kinds of things um and so that was kind of our that was kind of our approach to to all of it and we realized it is a it is a pretty comprehensive uh change but happy to to answer any questions i can Okay, questions from the RAF. Go ahead, Austin. I thought you were lunging at it. <laughs> sure, I'll start. Uh -huh. I knew that you'd have one, but I thought you were lunging at it. I got a couple. Um, Multi-year discount on hunting licenses has always just been a dollar. Do we feel like that's enough from your department? It, where's that at in your mind? You know, it's it's interesting. It didn't uh, it didn't take off when we first introduced it, and it's been several years ago now. I'd have to go back in my notes and see when that started. Uh, it's caught on a lot more lately, so we do a lot more one dollar extensions than than we ever have. And you know, so from a from a, a licensing standpoint, that's that's beneficial to to just have people renew those and keep their license current whenever they whenever they set that that initial three hundred sixty five day valid date. So they have gotten a lot more popular in the last two or three years is what the, what the data looks like. Um, and so, yeah, we, I think it's in a, I think it's in a pretty good spot from, from a licensing standpoint. Can I ask another one? Um, do we have an auto renew option on hunting licenses and is that being contemplated? Currently we don't. We're, we're working on ways to, to make the renewal process as easy as we can. And one of them is just a, a full uh, opt-in auto renew where, where that can happen automatically. And I think uh, that one we're, we're kind of putting more on the, the forefront here in the next year or two. So I think that's a, an option you'll probably see on the ground soon. What about last time um, when you increased the non-resident fees? Did that go through this same process? And must fee increases always go through this process of rack and board, then legislation, then governor? So when when we when we want to um, when we see a need to increase them, we we like to vet them through the rack and board. Obviously, when we did this in 2019, it was kind of a the the, the legislature can always change fees, um, and so it was more. It was more of an approach during session to address some some concerns and some needs we had on the ground then, and so that's why that one didn't go through the the rack and board process. It kind of sprung up organically at the at the legislature. Okay. Austin, is turnaround fair play? Can I ask you a question? <laughs> so this is this fees and, and what it costs to hunt in different areas is kind of the world that you live in. Um, how do you think, where do you think, how are we doing? Are we, are we in a, are we in a fair place for the public in Utah? Um, this is kind of personal opinion, but um, yeah, that's, that's, I, I know. Y Utah, in my opinion, is a very difficult state to compare to its neighbors. It's very difficult to compare to Idaho and Montana, which are very cheap states to hunt in as a resident. Utah is very expensive when you compare to those states. Uh, but the opportunities here are totally different. So I always look at Utah as let's put it in the forefront and let's be different. We have different species. We have different opportunities. Um, so honestly, I don't compare it as much. It is expensive to hunt as a resident. I'll say that. Um, but it is a, a thriving, growing state. And I think we have to look on the positive side. Okay. Thank you. Curious, Austin, if we're if we're now entered podcast realm, I've got a question for you. And you, you commented on resident. What about non-resident? Because my perception is it's it is expensive as a resident and it's cheap as a non-resident. Would that be? Am yeah. I on base? Yes and no. It's hard to compare non-resident opportunity in Utah uh, because it is so slim. So if you ask non-residents, do they care what limited entry? tags cost in Utah, they do not care because they'll never draw one. And it's it's very hard uh, to compare that. So if you say, what is our hunting license as a non-resident? Yeah, we're 50% of what other states are for non-resident hunting license. But with our lack of over-the-counter hunts, non-residents can't hunt in our state. So that hunting license is just a paperweight to most non-residents. So take their money on the application fee side, that's where the biggest increase was two years ago. 
is they jumped that from $10 to 15. That was a substantial increase for a non-resident that can apply for all 10, you know, species applications. So his budget just went up substantially and I hope that helped the budget uh, for you guys, but it is expensive, very low opportunity from a non-resident. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think both of those comments are really valid to this discussion. So thank you for providing your expertise in the bigger picture. Other questions? Okay, I got another one. I, I just thought <laughs> someone was going to break it up. But um, so this will get into my comments a little bit, but mountain lion, cougar, I feel like it's very expensive. Is there a method or a way to right size that and to align it better with how we feel about cougars under recent changes in management or should we stay away from it? Are you thinking of a specific cougar on the list? Like which, which one were you thinking? Just, uh, I believe the to... fee would apply to the harvest objective and the over the counter spot and stock tag, not the pursuit. Um, it just seems really high to me. So I'm wondering if, is there a way to align that or is now the time to recommend it? Or is that not, is that too specific of a recommendation? No, I think, uh, I think a recommendation would be fine for that. And, uh, you know, we, we have talked about it. We've, we've discussed it. And I think, I think we're in a pretty good balancing point in our, in our minds with, with kind of the opportunity there and, and what we're trying to accomplish on the ground. So I think we're in a pretty good spot, but now is certainly the time to, to think about or propose it, so. One more. So on a, some other states like Colorado, California, they're on a program where they increase their fees every year based on their cost of living or whatever ratio they go off of. Utah doesn't do that. So I feel like it puts you in a hard spot and you say, hey, it's been 10 years, be happy. And then here's the increases. Is there a schedule? that we should expect you guys to look at this every so many years or is it just when needed? That's a great question. And what we do is we analyze it every year. So we, we look at our needs on the ground with, with revenue coming in and try to balance that. And we've been really fortunate in Utah and I think probably the envy of the West to, to be um, having our, our revenue come in at about the same pace as, as, as everything else. And so I think we've, we've been really fortunate that way. I think from, you know, in the, in the circles that, that I talked to some of the other states in, I think there's a little bit of a two edged sword with the automatic increase. It's, if you need something, you know, that's different than CPI, if you, if you have a, an emergency come up or a need that comes up, it, they're, they're maybe not as flexible with, with some of that. And so I think, I think the, the situation we find ourselves now is, is a pretty good one because we can just, analyze that every year and then as we anticipate needs down the road that's when we come and and try to try to right size it and propose a little bit of an increase so from from my perspective i think we're fortunate that we've we've been in the in the boat we've been in and we hope we hope what we're proposing here will, will push us forward another four five six years so sorry <clears throat> um Four to, five, four to five to six years. And so like we've seen inflation, material costs um, increase dramatically. Um, we're seeing, you know, the division is requiring, well not requiring, but advocating increased opportunity. So you get some more permits. And so I assume that means you have to have more management staff for that. And if we've gone up, 10%, 15% material prices and cost of living, you're doing a similar sort of raise. Things we're, we're next year, two years from now, we're already gonna be behind the curve. So is this really, I mean, I think I'm not against this, but is it really sufficient? And you hear a lot of comments, most people are against it, but if you wanna manage properly, I mean, I think that's pretty overstating the, the impact five to six years is what we'll have to address it seems sooner. Yeah, that's a that's a fair question too, Barton. I, I think uh, to answer the first part of that, our our FTE count or our full time equivalent count is relatively flat, so that stays pretty flat. It's just the cost associated with with some of that staff time, and then and then all of the things associated with our with our current expenses. And so, 
it, like I said, it's, it's hard to have the crystal ball, but we, we anticipate this revenue will push us through. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to outguess the markets right now because they are, they are kind of wild, but um, we anticipate that it'll, it'll move us through four for sure. And then if we can get a little more mileage out of it, that'll be great. So if you don't anticipate, if you don't anticipate FT increasing, do you, use contract staff to do some work? Do you see an increase in that to manage objectives if we're having a higher impact in the landscape? You know, I think we're in a good spot with a lot of different partnerships, federal, local, state, all, you know, a lot of different partnerships that help us do the work on the ground. So I think we're in a good in a good spot there. I don't anticipate a lot of, of extra on top. I think I think the, the workforce is strong and I, th I think we're accomplishing a lot of stuff. It's just all the ancillary things cost a lot more and we hope we hope some of this plateaus and and we can kind of weather the the storm for a little bit as they said in the marine corps hope is not a good course of action yeah well <laughs> i'm not saying we're hoping this works <laughs> okay i'll take it as sarcastic because we we know the analysis is true and we we know the revenue will will push us we hope the market conditions can calm down, which we have no we have no impact or, or bearing on. So. Okay, let me re respond to that just a little bit. Um, you know, we've always taken pride, Bart. Um, the the Utah Division of Wildlife on a per capita basis has always been one of the smallest agencies, not only in the West but in the country. And in terms of the amount of work that we get done for the size of staff that we have, um, is it, something that we're proud of. Um, we stretch people and we push people pretty hard at times and we have to find efficiencies where we can. Um, but the, the legislature looks at our FTE count at times, maybe even more critically than they do our budget. So it's one of the things that we, we, if we're approving a new, a new position, it's not without a lot of, of, um, analysis to make sure we need it. So. Thanks, Kevin. So have we have we looked at um, or you looked at uh, taking this to the legislature to talk about uh, tax increase for the division or a tax for the division of wildlife? I know there are other states that did use um, taxes from the the public. Uh, I know Missouri does one eighth of a percent and have funded a lot of their non-game programs off that, a lot of uh, revenue from those taxes. Has that been attempted or talked about? We do get a little bit of tax money from the legislature. We're about 92% self-funded, and the other 8% comes from, from tax revenue for, for really specific things, um, some public law enforcement and acts, you know, civil access and those kinds of things, AIS issues. Um, so we do get a little bit of that, so we're always – kind of finding those balances every year with with what we need as we build our budgets for the for the upcoming year. Chuck, I think given the the political realities of Utah, um, I think we would only propose a tax that was specific to wildlife if we have a, had a director we didn't like because he wouldn't survive that. <laughs> so is that <laughs> no, we like the current one, but but that's that would be kind of a, a signal if that ever happens. So. Yeah, a whole lot of brown nosing going on here. Um, I have too much dirt on him to need to brown nose. <laughs> uh, uh, quick question, and I'm not sure you know how you do this in the in the total budget, but. Um, I realize that there's a, a ton of projects, like whether it's fire rehab or whatever else that, that funding is leveraged with, you know, state, local, federal partners, whether you're talking WIR or, you know, the fire in general. Um, is that, have you taken that into effect? Or, I mean, that's a dumb question, but can you clarify that part of it? Maybe if there's a need for that increase. You know, I think I think this will help. We we do try to leverage all of our partnership dollars and and match it with state funds when we can. So we typically with with federal money or something like that, we can we can turn a, a state dollar into three so um, additional federal dollars. And so I, we we feel like that's in a in a pretty good spot as well. 
Okay, and I think the other thing she was asking, there have been years, Tammy, when when we have a big fire year where we have gone to the legislature for supplemental funding and they've always been, they've always come up with their, um, they backed us on that. So that, that uh, the, the process there has been when we need it, we ask for it and we've always gotten it on a case by case basis or on an annual basis. Yeah. Is that, is that accurate, Kenny? I think so. Yes. If, uh, uh, sorry, I missed that that part of no, the no question. no you're good because it's a complex issue and there's several different layers to that so i you know i know dwr is their separate little critter over here but they're still under the umbrella of dnr and and we all have to work together i mean you know like you were saying in your opening remarks we're all the same team and uh you know i mean there's a lot of different programs that go into those i was going to laugh on on your your meadow your irrigated meadow on which which of the little critters like the flowers, you know, like which one are those are? <laughs> Sorry, I, I just need to be quiet. No, and that, that is a great question. And, and you know, Jay and, and the director's office and, and our leadership team, I think we do work well with DNR to, to kind of set those priorities every year and, and make sure we're, we're uh, kind of all on the same page as we go through the, the session, so. So it seemed like in your presentation, you're 5 million short or something. Uh, this end of the table, between ranching and agriculture, there's a lot of things we're doing without in this economy. You guys think about cutting back on stuff? I think we're always looking to right size our efforts on the ground. I think that that's always part of the that's always part of the equation. What we're seeing a need for is is recent increases in in staffing, and then all the things that that you're well aware of in in our in our current expense increases as well. So, yeah, absolutely. I think we're we're cognizant of that, um, mindful of it, um, and we and we do have those hard conversations. So I think that's I think that's a fair point. I do you have specific examples of things you may have cut recently? Uh, I could probably think of some. I, right, right off the top of my head, I don't have a, a really good example of that. But um, I, I can just tell you, overall, we we try to work plan each year in advance and, and make sure everybody's got a, a priority and, and set their their work plan on the ground, and then budget according to that work plan. Um, and maybe maybe Kevin's gotten a, sp a specific one from. Well, I think you know I think COVID kind of forced us into one that's becoming really helpful right now. We're driving a lot less than we used to because of the opportunity to have, you know, meetings online and and like my, I drive to Salt Lake probably a third less than I used to pre-COVID, and I because of the time I spend on on meetings I was, prior to COVID I was driving thirty thousand miles a year and now I'll probably drive twenty. And, and and I'm very high because of because of my job and and the and the, requ the requirement to be in Salt Lake on a fairly regular basis. I was going to save this for a comment, but I'm going to do it as a question based on this conversation. I I almost have the opposite question. So uh, I work in a industry where people are uh, bought into the mission of the job. And historically, it's been really easy to hire. I get a lot of applicants, but recently I don't um, due to the economy. I'm very nervous. Is the division doing enough for its employees? There's nothing more important than the employees. And the opportunity I've had to work with the division employees that I've worked with, I can't say enough good about them. I don't think I've ever been around better than we currently have, particularly the biologists, uh, but everyone. So I really have a concern. Are we being aggressive enough? Yeah, that is a good question, Brandon. I think uh, I think this current administration and former ones have been cognizant of that. Losing a losing a tenured state employee is tough, especially if they still have uh, time that they can they can work. It's hard enough when they eventually can retire, but if we're if we're losing them, you know, kind of mid career, that's that's even. That's even tougher. So, I think we we are very cognizant of of keeping the people that we can, and and we've done we, we've seen some nice uh, things recently, uh, even at the, the very beginning of this legislative session. Uh, decent colas 
you know, those, those don't make or break uh, a, a lot of times, but, but I, I lived through the times when that was non-existent. And so seeing some, some, you know, some traction there and then doing some things above and beyond that. There were some targeted increases this last legislative session that really helped biologists and we were excited. We were excited about that one. So it is a concern. I think, you know, trying to fill a couple a couple roles in my section recently is is uh it's been a, a little bit of an eye opener because the the numbers are definitely down and the and the maybe the quality of applicant isn't quite what it has been too. And so I think I think we're facing some of those same some some of those same challenges. Chad, do you have a question? You know, actually I have a comment, so I'll just wait. Okay, we'll come back to you. Any additional questions? Questions from the public. Okay, we have one comment card from the public from Kevin with SFW. Oh, Hold on, let me, let's go ahead and summarize. Let me summarize the, the online comment. So if, if there was there was eight people that commented on this, um, almost unlike the last one, almost everybody that got on also submitted a comment and they were, you know, they kind of reflected what, what's been talked about here and especially in the other racks, there's people had a strong feeling one way or the other. We had 40% strongly agreeing and 60% strongly disagreeing. Um, those that that agreed, you know, went along the lines with like um, Braden's comment and those that disagreed went along with the comment that, that Verlin made that there's a lot of people that are going without right now and, and life's gotten more expensive and this makes it harder to get families out and, and we're, we're sensitive to that. Um, one of the things that's, that's interesting about our funding model because we're, we're essentially self-funded as a state agency when the legislature gives all state employees a raise, they don't give us the money to cover it. We have to find that within our existing budgets. And so um, that becomes a challenge sometimes. Oh, we've always managed to do it, but it but it it eats into the other things that we need to do. So okay, Kevin. I want to point out that Austin was trying to ask questions to make his job easier. Did you look over at Riley's shirt by chance? Nobody cares. Work harder, right? Um, Kevin Norman representing SFW. Um, we're just here in support of the, the division's recommendations. Um, we know that nobody wants to pay more money, but we also know it's absolutely necessary. Um, we work close with the division, and I don't know any of them getting rich. Um, if you ask them on monster muleys, they might think they are, but I, I don't know any of them that are. Um, appreciate their efforts. I also appreciate the fact that uh, they were looking out for two of our most important groups in the state, the kids and the veterans, and holding off on the increases for them. Um, as a dad, um, I know the value of um, the tradition of hunting and to be able to keep that alive and well and, and uh, easier on families is, is important. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for your time. And uh, we're in full support of this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to comments from the rack. Um, before I turn it over, I just want to maybe elaborate on my question a second ago with my first comment. Uh, I am very sensitive and understand that people are, cash is tight, it's getting tighter. Um, and so we hate to see things go up in cost. At the same time, it costs money to have what we have in Utah. And I think uh, it, it's, it's necessary. Um, I really am concerned I, I really am concerned, are we doing enough? Um, I say that looking at my own profession and how difficult it is to hire and keep employees currently. And we talked at the beginning of this meeting, we had the employee leave after 30 years and the word institutional knowledge was used. Um, there's nothing worse than losing it a biologist just when he's getting in the groove. Uh, and you've got to feed your families. Sometimes you don't have a choice. So I, I, am sensitive and nervous are we doing enough i i look at who we have and the people that i've been fortunate to go out and watch them do their jobs 
and I just can't say enough good about them. So uh, that's a concern of mine. I, and in our current market, it's tougher and tougher to keep that food on the plate for your families. So I, I think we need to make sure we're taking care of the number one resource for people. Um, and that's a little bit outside of the discussion, but I, I do want to make that comment. So other comments from the rack. I have a comment. Go ahead, Chad. Chad. And, and I just wanted to say um, that I think this, the license fees are a great value. And maybe that's contrary to what most people are saying here today. And I understand when you're buying a license for the whole family, it's expensive. It's expensive when you buy a movie ticket for your whole family or go to Disneyland. But I can go fishing for a whole year for the cost of a license. I'll spend more in gas on a fishing trip than I will for the cost of my license for a year. And putting it in perspective, I, I think this the value we get for the amount of money we spend is exceptional. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Merlin, did you have a comment? Yeah, I've got a comment. So from my perspective, you're raising the cost and it's widely known in about every meeting we go to about the quality and the number of animals and that has gone down. So uh, it kind of bothers me that DWR sells a ticket at a higher cost now. And a lot of times you're not going to be able to fill that ticket because the animals aren't there or you're not a good enough hunter or whatever it is, but you're selling tickets for something that's not there anywhere else. That'd be illegal. Um, and then to raise it, I think you can look internally and cut some fat out of the program. Maybe not, not, chain one of those areas that don't have any water there because and the animals never use it. Use a little common sense before you do some of these projects and use the money at a better place. I don't, I'm not in favor of raising these, these rates. I think they're high enough as they are. Go ahead, Bart. I think I may have a little bit different thoughts on it. I mean, from a management perspective, if you're trying to increase the population, we have to take proactive strategies, which costs money. Um, and inflation is going up, you need the money. So you have, to, you have to get the money from somewhere else. And reducing the projects or not doing projects isn't really a solution or an answer to it because you're not going to have any proactive ways to increase those populations. Um, so you need projects, you need money to do it. If you're worried about reducing pressure, this does that as well, in that you're increasing your, your fee, so that does create a barrier to entry for some, and so you may reduce some pressures there and fewer people buying in. So I think it actually it addresses the issue in two ways. You may reduce pressure and you're going to raise revenue to do more projects and do do better management of your resources. And I know people don't like the idea of the first part, what I said, because we're trying to increase opportunities and it does. I can understand why people don't want to pay more, but I think I think you have to, especially in today's environment. And I believe I agree with what Chad said. You know, I was talking with somebody about this. I was like, well, if you increase the fee by $15 or $5, well, you know, don't go to straws three times in a week. <laughs> I mean, I, that's again, flippant, but you know, there's those very ways you can cut your, you, you don't have to spend so you can then buy that um, permit. Anyways, that's all I have to say, thanks.
Yeah, I, I, you know, I've worked. I'm I'm the wildlife coordinator for the for the Fish Lake and the Dixie National Forest, and um, have worked with some of these biologists now for for going on 20 years. And and I'll tell you, we have some of the best um, wildlife and aquatic biologists and habitat biologists that I've that I've ever had the pleasure to work with. So, I have a great respect for their abilities and the work they do. And our working relationship um, between my biologists and the state biologists has never been better. Um, it, it's really a really a great group of people to work with who know what they're doing and get stuff done. And so I, um, as a as a federal agency, I I really enjoy working with them. And we don't I don't think we've ever had a better working relationship. Um, so I, I I fully support this. I know what it takes to get that job done and and I know uh, that uh, that these people aren't making a ton of money um, so I I support it go ahead Craig uh, I understand the problem with the uh, input costs are uh, <laughs> pretty good but uh, you talk to these people uh, the, like Mer Merlin and Tammy, you know, they're going to bring their cows off the range this fall and, and uh, $350 hay and uh, they're $400 hay if you got a premium <coughs> hay and uh, they're going to have to sell cows because they can't afford to, to do it, you know, and so uh, they're, they're having to cut not only their find ways to cut their operation, but cut their opportunity to to make money and so uh you know i understand uh, input costs but sometimes you have to cut the you know make the cuts i'm not taking my family to disneyland i'd rather hunt there's my cut Go ahead, Ryan. All right, I'm trying, I've been trying to phrase this in my head a couple of, of different ways. Um, with, without trying to sound too blunt, I'm gonna give everybody a quick business lesson right here. You can never save your way to wealth. You can't do it. And in this case, the wealth is wildlife and habitat in the state of Utah. And so it doesn't matter how much we cut, although I appreciate the efforts and I think the division is doing that, the only way to increase that is to increase revenue. And it doesn't matter if it's in wages or if it's in habitat projects or whatever it is being earmarked for, the only way to do that is to increase revenue. Right now in the United States of America, the dollar has never been worth as little as it currently is, ever ever in the history. So the only way to offset that is going to be to continue to increase. I've seen that in my own businesses and it doesn't matter how much somebody complains about the price of whatever it is that I'm offering, I am not willing to eat that in order for somebody else to save a little bit. Can't do it, we won't survive that way. Neither will the wildlife in the state of Utah. Um, so my comment would be in agreement with the price increase. Um, it's the only way that we're going to be able to be able to finance and to maintain the budget moving forward for the wildlife, which is the resource that we're talking about. A uh, couple comments. I feel like um, the division has always been good at putting wildlife first. For example, at the elk committee meeting, we're having a debate about um, multi-season elk permits. There's some heartache over, do we continue them? Do we do away with them? And it would be a big hit if you just took it away. It'd be over a million dollars right out of the budget if uh, we took away those multi-season permits. And the, the division employees have said, we'll figure it out. You know, well, the wildlife's going to come first. So that's what we need to do. We need to do it. So I commend them for that. Um, I'm in most, uh, mostly agreeable, I am mostly agreeable with these changes. A couple that I have heartache over. Um, our kids are always, 
at the front of our minds and they need to be like Kevin said in his comments, but we're always a non-resident somewhere. And I've seen this in other States when their neighboring state appears to be getting greedy, especially against non-residents, they in turn do the same thing. It's kind of a push and shove. And so we need to be careful. I feel like Utah is missing out on an enormous amount of non-resident youth because we don't have a non-resident youth structure. So I understood we, we have saved the youth prices, say for deer and elk, uh, for this year by not creating an increase, but yet we're still going to charge a non-resident youth $613 for general elk tag. It's pretty expensive. And I know we can say, hey, well, we're residents, forget those guys, but there's a lot of us in here and there's a lot of people in Utah that go to Arizona for a $25 deer tag and they go to Colorado for a $12 deer tag for their kids. And I would like to see more youth coming to Utah, relatives, grandkids, whatever it may be, but charging them hundreds and hundreds of dollars for an animal they're probably not even going to get uh, is too steep, in my opinion. What some other states have done is they've preserved resident youth fees to non-resident youth as well to keep it simple. I don't know if we want to go that far or create another category, but I would like to see non-resident youth cheaper. The other one I have heartburn over is cougars. So there was a time when we were all applied for cougar permits and we built up all these points. Now your points are worthless, right? Because we've got so many harvest objective, unlimited quota units. It's great. We've got the spot and stock permit, which is a great opportunity, but now it's going to be $64, right? For that permit. That's way too much in my mind. Now I'm not advocating for kill all the cougars, but I do not want to see a guy that spent $40 on his deer tag. Now looking at $64 for a add on cougar tag saying, no, I'm out. I ain't spending another $64. If I'm wrong on some of these numbers, feel free to call me out. But Arizona, for example, did a huge decrease on their non-resident and resident lions. They're $15 for a cougar tag in Arizona, $13 in Idaho. Um, it's cheap. And now us here in Utah as a resident, you're going to be over $100 with a hunting license and a cougar tag. Too expensive. So that's the one I want to see cut way back. I don't know if we need to make it up somewhere else or we'll sell so many of them at will offset. I don't know, but those are my comments. I'm going to jump in. I really agree with your comments, Austin. I think on the Cougar one, I think we need to take a look at that. Uh, those spot and stock, we're looking at extremely low success rates. I think if you get the price point right, most people would like to have one of those tags in their pocket with their deer tag, but not at 64 bucks. Um, but if you get that price point right, people are going to do that as an add-on. So I think that's a, a great way to increase revenue by reducing costs. I think you can increase the total. You're selling a piece of paper. Uh, the harvest rate's so low. You're, you're selling a piece of paper, which people will buy for the right amount. Um, one other comment I want to make, just now that we're moving kind of into the cost of the permits, I, I want to make a comment in support of so not a change, but there's been some discussion about the dedicated hunter increase for the hours. I am supporting that. I think that program was in place to get hours to have people on the ground doing projects. I know there's a lot of people pretty excited about that increase. I think that's a very valid increase. So that's probably the only additional comment I want to make um, in regard to the specific increases. Go ahead, Chuck. There is one other... One other uh, a license that was mentioned. It's not working very good. Um, you mentioned in, uh, one of the other racks, and that was the one day eating license. Um, uh, we used to have that years ago, and I would take uh, scouts out, and would they buy the one day license because we were going camping for one day, and and then when they had to jump to three days and spend 15, 16 bucks, a lot of them just said, well, "I'm not, I'm just not fishing today," and so I think. I'm um, an opportunity for a one-day license uh, for five bucks for people just to say, "Oh, I'm in Utah for one day, or I'm, I'm on the mountain for one day. Um, that's all I'm going to be there. Can I just get a, a fishing license for one day?" And I, th I think that's an opportunity we're missing. 
Mr. Chair, can I just clarify one thing? So the spot and stock, we are not proposing an increase for Cougar. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate that clarification. Even at that, I wonder, I wonder how many, it'd be interesting to see a poll on that to see how many people are putting that in their pocket and what price point we could get everyone to put that in their pocket. I think there's a price point where everyone to do an add on. Chair, what would you say about um, even the har harvest objective? I mean, you can use dogs, you can go on an unlimited unit. Maybe aligning that closer to 30 would be. I, I feel like it, when a cougar tag has outpaced an elk and a deer tag, something's wrong in my mind. But, I'm not opposed to that, but I get a little bit. I get in trouble a little bit for being aggressive on predators. I feel like the spot and stock, we're not going to kill any. Those other ones, now we're talking about killing animals. But <laughs> Remind you, Chair, we're only talking prices. We're not talking quotas, thresholds, nothing. I, I would uh, agree with that assessment on not only the harvest object objective, but your your other one for an add-on because I uh, – got a kid that likes to hunt out of state and that's what they do. They add, you know, I mean, it's 10 bucks for a cougar tag or something like that. And, and honestly, everybody in my family and anybody else that I know would love to add that onto their deer tag or elk tag or whatever else you're doing. I, I think it's a good discussion when we're talking about how to increase revenue. I, I mean, in Nevada, when you go to your cart, it asks you to buy a cougar tag. I'd love to see that in Utah. And for the right price point, I think you can get a very high percentage of people buying it. Will that affect? So, you know, non-consumptive, I'm not a hunter. But I have a lot of friends who hunt. And they just get blown away by how many people they see on the landscape. So will this increase that? Will that make the experience even worse? I would answer more than likely not. Um, it's putting more tags in the hands of hunters that are already out there is what my goal is. Get more money out of those that are playing the game and make it more worth their time and generate more revenue for the department. But will they be out there longer? And so again, you're increasing that pressure. I hope so, Bart. I don't want them staring at a screen all day. I want them outside. Well, I guess you're kind of being flipped to my point of everyone else. They're like, I go down the Ponsagon, I go down Scudampa Road during hunting season, and every pullout you see 20 vehicles. You go up, I mean, everywhere you go in the Zion, everywhere you go to Hancock Road, where I live around Kanab, it's just overwhelmed. I mean, people are pissed off when they're going on the Zion, and it's just packed with people when you're going up all these places. They just don't like it. And that's that's why I'm bringing that point up. Well, I'll, I'll give you a challenge, and, and it should be a challenge that all of us should take on, but getting non-consumptive outdoor recreationists to purchase a hunting and fishing license. Many states have tried to figure it out because that's how wildlife and the outdoors are funded, um, but we've struggled to do that over the years, and I'd like to see more of that. And a lot of that comes through education and outreach, but even if you don't hunt, you should have a hunting license because it's going to the right place so that you can see wildlife, so your roads are taken care of, so that there's more birds. That's all a good thing, right? It sounds good, but it's a perverse incentive. It, you know, we're getting a little off track, but it has worked. There's been states that have done good marketing campaigns to get you to purchase, purchase duck stamps, and it's been very successful at times. Um, so I think it's a valid discussion be interesting to see how to do it, but it's worked with duck stamps. I have one more comment or question. Because the cougar spot and stock is a director's action, is that why it's not included in the fee schedule and we can't touch it? I think we just decided not to make a change on it. And it looks like we issue about 1,100 of them. If that helps anything. Let's uh, let's try to stay. I think it's been good discussion, but let's try to focus on the actual increases and see if we can 
move towards a motion. We've had a couple discussions on some of the increases. Any more discussion? Yeah, go ahead. I just, we've kind of, a couple have made a, a uh, indication that the rate increase would help uh, the numbers. I boldly disagree with that. Water will make the, help the numbers more than anything else. I'm not sure that that's boldly disagreeing. I think we all agree that water is number one. <laughs> if anyone disagrees with that, we need to have a talk. <laughs> Figure out how to make that happen. We'll pay that fee. Any other comments? Go ahead, Vernon. Well, my comment earlier was that I think that you can tighten your belt like we are. I mean, uh, I, I'm i not gonna feed $400 my cows. It's just not economical, I can't do it. And right now I'm down almost 150 head from what I normally run due to the drought. And so uh, there's that whole other side. I've got to, I'm cutting down for expenses and you know, and whether it's not doing a project because, and there's several projects I've seen that common sense would have said, that's not going to do any good for the wildlife because there's no, no water source there. And there's no way you can drill a well because it's BLM or it's forest service or, you know, so I think there's areas and I know there's areas and the, and the thing about DWR that's widely known to the ranchers end of it, you, you, there's no oversight. There's very, you don't answer to anyone but yourself. And you say, well, my money doesn't come from the legislature, so, you know, they can't audit me. They, there's, that's what makes me nervous. I think you guys can look hard internally and yeah, don't, you don't have to cut your biologists, but maybe some projects, maybe. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if you raise the prices too much, like a lot of the majority of these comments were that that you're going to price some of these hunters out of the market. And so that's my comment. I think you can look internally and make some some cuts, and they don't have to be employees, but. There's a lot of times common sense will tell you, yeah, we can spend the money there. And yeah, like you said, we spend one dollar and the federal government gives us three dollars, so we better spend it. Well it it's coming back to bite you, it looks to me like. I got your comment. Um you know, with the state of the economy and the issues that we're having nationwide with Inflation, the optics of being increased definitely isn't very good at this time. But I think what's working with all the wildlife biologists here in the southern region, especially kind of echo what Chuck said, we're getting a lot of good work done on the ground and division is definitely a huge part of that. Vernon's mentioned that there's been some projects that have been put in places where there wasn't any water, but We've had a few of those, but we have developed water too. And it's just made that country a lot better for those permittees. And it is helping their bottom line. I know a lot of the permittees are taking taking cuts through their pocketbook, especially with drought conditions. And unfortunately, I think that's the West wide. You know, from the Mississippi River basically to the West, cows are going on the market more than they ever had in probably the past 30 years. It's definitely tough times and the weather is a pretty key factor in that. But that is part of livestock, ranching and farming. I come from a farm and ranch and we've made those cuts too and we're feeling the pain. And when you can't buy diesel for under five bucks a gallon, you know, it's getting pretty tough out here. And with the $400 a ton hay, it's gonna be another tough year for everybody. And I think, 
the opposites are are really bad right now. If we would have had an increase in fees a couple of years ago when the economy was thriving and everything was going well, I think it would have been a little bit more palatable to everybody. But uh, you see from the comments that there was a lot of objection to it. But I do support the fee increase. I think with the work that we can't just stop doing the work on the ground. We can't take a year off. We have pinion and juniper encroachment that's infesting BLM and Forest Service lands at an incredible rate. And if we take a few years off, we're going to be in trouble and we're going to get behind on, on creating good habitat for wildlife. And we have appreciated the division they've come in with with funding to help our projects. They've added seed to our projects. And BLM and Forest Service also, they put in a ton of funding. We have millions of dollars that we put down here in the southern region. And we're going to continue doing that. But we're in a position where we can't take a year off. You know, we got to keep on getting these habitat improvements on the ground. And I think with the fees that are being paid right now and with these increases, we're going to be able to continue doing that. One thing I agree with some of the comments on the on some of the increases, they seem well out of balance. And I don't know someone there could make a motion to take a look at some of those. I can see a $5 increase on some of these, and that's palatable. That shouldn't be too big of a deal. But where there's these larger fee increases, I think a harder look needs to be taken at that. And maybe two or three down years down the road when the economy is improved, maybe they could be re-looked at. That's my comment. Thanks, Dan. Go ahead, Vernon. And my comments, I don't mean to say don't do any any projects. I just say use use more common sense and maybe do some more studying. I hate to say that because a lot of times these studies just show what common sense would have said. But just be a little more frugal with where you spend your money on some of these projects that that don't have the ability to to produce and we've seen it on the henry mountains and it's mainly even at full rainfall of eight inches down there there's been a lot of reseedings done that haven't worked and it was obvious to the rancher that it wasn't going to work because they don't get enough rain down there and then we can go into the buffalo Other comments? How do we want to approach this? Do, do we want to look at motions specific to any uh, specific fee increases, or do we want to do a motion that would encompass all of it? If there, I, I guess what I would propose is if you guys have some fees that you're concerned with, let's make some individual motions on those fees and then pass the rest as presented. Or if we want to do it as a package, I'm open to that too. But if there's specifics, let's get a motion out for those specifics. Go ahead, Austin. Um, I can do one on the youth, see where it gets us. But I move that we create a non-resident youth general elk permit and a non-resident youth general deer permit fee to match the resident youth prices. Do we have a second? Second. On that? So we have a motion by Austin and a second by Vernon. Uh, as a dad who takes his kids to multiple states every year, I fully support this. I'm going to spend a lot of money in that state chasing my kids' cheap tags. Okay, let me restate that um, so that we have it for, for Alyssa back at the office. So the motion is to create a non-resident youth general elk and, and deer fee that matches the resident deer and elk youth prices. That that capture it okay so we have a motion and a second any further discussion all right let's vote oh go ahead chuck so we when we're talking about youth we're talking about the same age structure we're for for the residents into okay okay let's do a roll call on this where we have a couple of people online so we'll start over here at vernon Yes. Craig? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Art? Yes. Chuck? 
Yes. Riley? Yes. Austin? Yes. Chad? Yes. And Dan? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, any other specific? Go ahead. I'll try the Cougar. Um, I move that we lower the proposed cost of the Cougar permit to $30 and do not increase the Cougar pursuit permit fee. I should leave it at $30 as well. Okay. So the spot and stock and the pursuit permit for thirty dollars. That's what you're. So spot and stock is unchanged under their proposal, so that would remain at thirty, and we drop instead of increasing the harvest objective limited entry down to thirty, keep okay. and keep pursuit they had going from thirty to fifty. Keep that at thirty, so all cougar becomes thirty unless I'm missing something. Okay, you got that one, Kevin. We have a second on that. I'll second. Tammy seconds that. Any further discussion? Let me restate it quick just to just to make sure. So the motion is to reduce the proposed cost of a cougar permit to thirty dollars and and do not increase the cost of a of a pursuit permit, which would also keep it at thirty dollars. Okay. Go ahead. So we're reducing it from what to thirty? From fifty to thirty, um, and so your your hope is that we'll make more money. I'm sorry. So, really, you want to you just want to kill more cougar, but you're hoping that you'll have more revenue created because you have lower fees. You get more people involved. I would say, Bart, for me, this is not so much biological. I'll leave that to the biologist. It's more of a social thing. I, feel I understand that. Six, I said you want to kill yeah, over $60 is just getting socially too expensive for these guys, and therefore they're not purchasing the tag. Okay. Bart, maybe a comment I would make is these units are controlled other than the spot and stock, which is unlimited, but the, the other permits are controlled. So you aren't going to increase to harvest necessarily because you have a controlled amount that will be taken. The spot and stock isn't controlled, but we're talking minuscule harvest there. Are we not meeting, are we not meeting objective in these areas, in these units? It's varied. It, it's varied. There's, yeah. there's, and it depends on snow conditions and many other things, but oftentimes we have units that, that don't, don't meet the harvest objective for Cougar. Is that because of not enough permits were purchased or is it just because they're not successful so you, I, this is getting into some theory i, I know it's a getting bit, into but, the weeds i'm just but I, I would comment here bart that the on the pursuit specifically you got to have dogs and the dogs are limited and they're used so by selling more tags you aren't producing more dogs i, I know we have a lot of dogs in canada <laughs> yeah so you, you're not going to you're not going to increase the amount of dogs running cats with the additional tags. <laughs> okay, any further discussion? Okay, let's do a roll call again. Austin? Yes. Riley? Yes. Chuck? Yes. Barr? No. Berlin? Yes. Craig? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Dan? Yes. Chad? No. Okay. Um, Bart and Chad, do either of you want to stay, say your reason for no or leave it at that? Right. Chad? I'm good to just leave it at that. I think the discussion was pretty good on it. Okay. Thank you. Additional motions. So that was seven to two if my, if my math oh, is correct. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Seven to two. Any additional motions specific? Go ahead, Chuck. So I, I motion that we bring back the one day fishing license. Um, just to, I think it'll generate more revenue, but I, I think, and opportunity. So I, I motion that we bring back the one day fishing license. Do you, want, a, do you want to propose a fee of, with that? I would propose or? a $5 fee. A second on that motion.
No second. Okay, Craig will second that. Any additional discussion on that? You have that motion, Kevin. You want to read that and then we'll vote? Yeah, the motion is to reinstate the one-day fishing license for a $5 fee. All right, Austin. Real quick on discussion, do we do we know, was that an administrative thing why that went away? I didn't catch why that went away. So I can probably clarify that, Austin. So a few years ago, we we made the dis the decision to just make it a, a three day. We had a lot of people come into the state to to fish for a weekend, and so we went from a one day strategy to a three day. Um, we think it was pretty comparable then. Five, I think uh, five for a one day. I think we we're already at, if memory serves, we were probably at ten or twelve before we we implemented that so we wanted to add that extra couple of days for the weekend for the for the person buying the one day so it was a that was a strategy decision we made at the time to to expand that to a three day um, and then just offer the the three and the seven for those that were buying short term and and I mean to clarify so so Utah our, our strategy really is to to push people to full season. We think the value is in that full 365 day license because you you set your year when you buy it. Um, and then from full season um, to multi-year and extensions and from fishing to combination, we, we kind of want to incentivize people to to kind of broaden their horizons in that direction. And so we've been really cognizant of of that. And so that's where that's where the three the three day came from a few years ago. Thank you for that input there. I, I actually remember the conversation at the time when we looked at that. I hate to blow up someone's motion, but there was a lot of discussion a few years ago about getting rid of that, and it was a pretty logical reason that was voted on. I would I would be inclined to leave it alone, but that's to everyone to vote. We got a second, so we're going to vote on it. So uh, what's the price now on a three-day? Three-day is... Yeah, it's right around 16 is what I was thinking. So $5 a day, huh? Roughly, yeah. 16, uh, currently the three-day is 16, and the proposed fee would be to 19, so $3 increase there. It doesn't make sense to make it you do less than you could do three one days and not have to worry about not pay the three-day. And so it seems it should be, you know, I would do something like 19 divided by three plus one. <laughs> well, then you incentivize them to, to get a three. If they just do one day, they're going to be paying more than I than think what you just said is you agree with me. Well, no, I, I, don't, hey, I think what do you mean? No, I agree with what Chuck said that I think, <laughs> you know, if, if Boy Scouts are coming in for a day, you should give them an opportunity. And, you know, if I, when, I, you, when I was a kid, I wouldn't want to pay that. To clarify one thing real quick that I think we may have forgotten also is we did implement a program where you can get a group free day of fishing. So if you have a scout group you're taking out, you just have to apply and you can take the whole group fishing for nothing, right? Isn't yeah, it's free. free. It's free. So you, you just have to register. So the scout group or the young men, young women group, whatever it may be, youth group, uh, there's that opportunity to take those youth for free to show them the joy of fishing. All right, let's vote. Austin. No. Riley. <laughs> I, I know it's too late for comments, so I but I had several. Um, I would say no then. Chuck. Yes. Bart. We're gonna see if you agree with me or not. <laughs> well, I agree with you. I just want more. I think we should pay more than the five dollars. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Tammy. I'm gonna say yes. Craig? Yes. And Merlin. Yes. Dan. Yes. And Chad. No. Boy, I didn't keep track. Where did that end up? <laughs> three opposed and passes. passes six to three. Okay. Motion passes. Um, those that voted no, Austin, you can comment now, Riley. <laughs> All right. So I, I wanted to know more of what the impact would be financially. Um, 
and wondered if we should not have not necessarily tabled it, but maybe put that for something for the division to look at to get back to us on rather than form it as a motion and try to push it through to get us more um, information on the exact amount. Because if we're talking to $5, again, that doesn't make any sense that you can now, according to that, do it cheaper than you could the with the current. I'd like to know what, it, what the current one day was when it went away. Um, there was just some, some information in there that I think was lost that I would have liked to have had before we made a motion. It felt a little bit too flyby. Thanks, Riley. Austin or Chad, any comments? I don't fish. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are ways to shoot fish. <laughs> Chad? I, I do fish. I just thought it was a little bit hasty and uh, I, I would want to know more about it and, and maybe what i'd ask is uh, we may want a little more information at the wildlife board meeting to just discuss i i think we could keep it really brief but they're ultimately the ones that would vote on that and so maybe a couple of those comments we could have ready when we are up there sure thing thank you we are way past comments, Tammy. Go ahead. I, I, I know, but you know, I've got to have a smart aleck comment. Seems how we have a board member on. Isn't he still on? Um, when have we ever made a? He, he's not on anymore, so you can't make oh, a comment. Oh, I'll have to text him then. The whole the whole point is is when have we ever made a single motion from a rack that's gone on to pass through the board? Half of the racks are already over and done. You only got what? two more this week and it's over. I don't think the wildlife board's gonna. Now I will point out that Craig made the motion at our last, at the last meeting to not to have landowner general season deer permits not lose their bonus points and the board accepted that motion exactly as it was stated. In fact, and I know that was a little tongue in cheek, Tammy, but I would comment that, yeah, we do it frequently. Um, the board has passed many things over the years that a rack has come up with. So I, I think, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was easy. I mean, it's it's not easy, right? It has to make sense and it has to be well-founded, but it happens frequently. Okay, additional motions. Would anyone make a motion to accept the remainder then? I make the motion to accept the remainder. Thanks, Bart. Second on that. I'll second that. Thanks, Chad. So a motion to accept the remainder is presented. Chad with a second. Additional comments or discussion? All right. Let's do a roll call on that. Austin. Yes. Riley? Yes. Chuck? Yes. Bart? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Craig? No. Verlin? No. Dan? Yes. And Chad? Yes. So motion passes eight to two opposed. Uh, Verlin and Craig, that, that's do you want to? seven to two. Sorry, seven to two. You're right. Verlin and Chad, do you want to, or Craig, do you want to expound on that or kind of your comments that you've already said? You. I think comments I made. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I think my comments pretty much cover how I feel. I think. I think in this economy, in this time, that we don't need to raise rates. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. With that said, that's our last Be item. Before we go on, can I just ask Alyssa if she's still on? Did you get all of the who made the motions in the seconds? That's the one place where we sometimes struggle with the minutes. Maybe maybe we didn't get any of it because I don't see Alyssa on anymore. I hope we'll, you got all that, Kevin. We'll rely on my notes. So <laughs> I've got some too, Kevin. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, next meeting, September 6th, 6 p.m. in Richfield. Don't come to Cedar City that night. You'll be late. So with that, we'll adjourn. Thank you. Get your gavel. It's your one chance. There you go.